Ah, yes. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Veterans Minimum. I'm your host, Nick Davis at The Lamb Show, is where you can find me. At Veterans Minimum is where you can find everything for the show. My guy, young PFF, young spicy sloth, Taryn in the building. What up, baby? What is up, man? How's it going? Good, good. I know when I text you the format of today's episode, you're like, I fucking love this kind of shit. So I know you're excited for this one. Oh, yeah. I, I'm all over it. This kind of stuff I could do all day long. Before we get into the episode, we got to take care of some notes. We got to plug some shit. And Taryn, you know me, dog. The less I got to edit, the happier I am. Yeah. Sounds about so right. I'm going to try and do this one take Drake. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I've seen you do it before. I, yeah, that, you were impressed. Come on, pull the curtain back a little. You were like, yo, I didn't I've, expect that. Yeah, I've been impressed multiple times. It's the first time especially. I mean, now I'm a little more used to it. First time especially, it's, it's a skill. It's a skill. The best part about that is um, when I stream and I got to read the chat, I can't read. Like it's between worried about getting sniped and not letting you down when we're playing Call of Duty and having to read the comments, it's too much for me. And also, oh, I got to tell you a good story. So my buddy Anthony, um, it was his birthday like two weekends ago. And mind you, I haven't gone out in a while because I've been saving up dough, kind of like, you know, the apartment shopping or, or, or apartment search really like fucked me up, man. That was... It was brutal, you know, paperwork and all that. Anyway, you know, kind of reiterating at this point. But so it's his birthday and he's like, hey, man, we're going out to this bar in Long Island. Like, pull up. I was like, yo, I'm down. I haven't seen you and Steve in a while. And them two were actually on Monday Night Raw this past week. Mm -hmm. They were performing live and that shit was fire. I was like, yo, no disrespect this is the coolest thing you guys have ever done by far. <laughs> like not even close. So anyway, it's Ant's birthday, and he tells me the name of the place. And he specifically tells me, Taryn, yo, there's two of them in Long Island. We're going to the one in Patchog. <laughs> He's like, yo, there's two of them. I was like, I bet. I'll be there. What time are you going? He's like, we're going to be there around 10, 30, 11. I was like, yo, dope, because it was a UFC fight night, and Corey Sanhagen was fighting, and he's one of my favorite fighters. So I really wanted to watch the main event. Anyway, I think you could kind of get the idea of where this is going. Yeah. Dude, I pull up to the place. I go inside. It's empty. I'm like, what the fuck? I looked at their Instagrams, and it's pretty popping. There's, like, a good amount of people there. I go upstairs, and then I call him. I'm like, yo, where you at? He's a, I was like, I'm upstairs. And he tells me, we're downstairs. What are you talking? There's no upstairs. I go, oh, man. He goes, yo, you went to the wrong one, right? I was like, man, I'm really fucking stupid. But they all started laughing. They're FaceTiming me and shit. I send them a picture of me with my hat on, thumbs up outside the place. Just like, I was like, yo, I'm really not that smart, bro. I just work really hard. And he's like, I know. I've noticed. I was like, good. At least we're on the same page. Oh, that is such a, it's just such a you thing to do, man. <sighs> and, you know, I pride myself on having an impeccable self-awareness and uh, being aware in all situations. That one wasn't it. Cheap. Oh wow! Having self awareness and being aware. Yeah, a combination Damn. of both. That's a lot of awareness. That's a lot of awareness. Ninety ninety eight awareness in Madden. Kind of <laughs> lost some some points over there. All right. Abner Mares is a world champion boxer, Olympian, sports commentator, and most importantly, a dad to two little girls. Beloved by abuelas and hardcore fans alike, Abner is a pro at entertaining the world both in and out of the ring. On Blue Wire's new podcast, On the Hook with Abner Mares, we'll hear from Abner, his family, fellow athletes, and other people who made him the boxer and the man he is today. From the state of boxing, Abner's journey from a kid on the streets to boxing champion, sports, music, culture, and family life. Listen to On the Hook with Abner Mares wherever you get your podcast episodes out on Tuesdays in English. And episodes in Spanish out on Wednesdays. You know what I'm saying? You get you get two two different set of bars, Taryn. A little Espanol and a little Inglés. What more can you really ask for at that point? Can't ask for Come much on. more. Uh, are you? I, I know you kind of used to dabble in. Um, you used to do like jujitsu and shit, didn't you? Or 
Yeah, I trained at Rufus Sport for like five years. I did kickboxing and jujitsu. Nice, man. Nice. It's yeah. um, that's all I think about now, dude. Like I've gotten to a point where I just like to train fucking combat sports, but I don't want to fight. It's just different level of training. It's crazy that you you were at Rufus before my buddy Jared was there for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Has right. <sighs> Not that I know of, but I didn't know of him really until you guys. Mm-hmm. So, and and I had already been out of there by that point, or at least like wrapping up. So I'm not sure. Like I might've been, I mean, there was a point for like the first three or four years, I was there like five days a week. So it's certainly possible. Dude. I I've fallen in love with jujitsu. I've talked about it so many times. I'm excited for this week net weekend. It's Habib and Gaethje. I'm super pumped yeah. about that. My favorite fighter, Robert Whitaker, is fighting too. And uh, if I had to power rank the three reasons why I want to move back into Queens and why I'm moving back into Queens, training jujitsu is is in the top three. Hmm. Closer to the gym over there too, and it's uh it's dope, man. I, I recommend it. I recommend it a lot. It's a uh, Super humbling. Are you a boxing fan at all? No. No? Not like, like big big fights don't excite you? Big fights excite me, but I wouldn't consider myself a boxing fan. Like, there's a, a couple guys where, like, if they're fighting, I'll want to watch. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like a lot of people feel that way. But I got to say, man, this past weekend – uh. Lopez and Lomachenko was pretty dope because Lopez is this young up and coming prospect. Again, I'm not going to pretend like I'm Teddy Atlas because I'm not. I don't even, I don't even know how to score things in boxing. Like I can in MMA, like MMA, I could tell you like, you know, if who scored a 10, nine, who scored a 10, eight, like where that's why, yo, the judges sometimes, man, I feel like it frustrates me so much, even if I don't have money on it, even if it's not a DFS play. I feel like it insults my intelligence as a fan <laughs> when like I see calls and they are wrong. Mm. Right? Like if there's a if there's a blatant holding call and it's like, dude, come on, man. Like, how do you miss that? Or a pass interference? And I'm also if I was a referee, I would be one of those referees where I wouldn't call pass interference on the last play of the game. Right? Like I think there's a time and place for certain fouls. Like there was an incident in the NBA playoffs. I know I'm jumping around a lot, but I'm going to make everything connect. There was a play. I think it was either game three of Milwaukee and the, the heat and Jimmy Butler takes a shot to end the game. And like Giannis doesn't let him land. And they call the foul. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like that's something you should call in the first, second, third quarter, early fourth quarter. But when the game's on the line, I, I feel like, there, there's a time and place and situations add to the perspective of the call. So do, are you with me on that? Do you feel like if you were a referee, there'd be you, – you, I'm not saying to, like, not call it down the line, but am I making sense where I think there's a time and place and, like, sometimes it's bigger than the ref's whistle? Yeah, and – there's something to be said about it being at the end of the game, especially if it's like a close call, because then you're deciding the outcome of the game instead of the players. You know what I mean? So it's like, I, I feel like I would be the same way where later in the game, close calls, you know, you don't, you don't want to be what, what decides it. That's kind of, you know, ruins it a little bit in my opinion. Yeah, I hate when referees take it into their own hands and they want to become bigger bigger than the game, right? Like there were referees like Scott Foster in the NBA. You just you just like you shouldn't know referee names. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like uh, Ed Hockley you knew in the NFL because like he was just fucking diesel, right? Like yeah. you just looked at him like, "Yo, that guy looks like a linebacker. What is he doing <laughs> roughing?" But I like I like boxing, man. I think boxing, a big boxing fight. My dad was telling me a story. He went to Atlantic City when Tyson won the title from Spinks. And, like, he knocked him out in 90 seconds or some shit. He's like, yo, there's just something about it when you're in at a casino or a hotel and there's a big fight atmosphere. So, like, with boxing, 
big boxing fights still bring that out. But I am more of an MMA guy. Mm -hmm. But if you get punched in the face, I respect the shit out of you regardless. Oh, yeah. Just because I'm not a big boxing fan, those those dudes have all my respect and, and more. I want to talk now a little bit of what this entire episode is going to be about. Um, we got some news in the NFL uh, earlier this week, a little bit after we finished recording the Monday episode. And that is that it's officially two a season. Tua is now going to be the starting quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. They're on a bye week this week. And then Miami comes back off the bye. And I'm pulling up their schedule right now. And they play the Rams at home, at the Cardinals, Chargers at home, at Denver, Jets. As a Giants fan, and you know me, if I could bring up the Giants in any way, <laughs> the boy's going to do it. I've experienced this before. I've seen this before. One of my first actual being able to comprehend football memories was something similar. And that was when Kurt Warner was the quarterback for the New York Giants in 2004, signing him on a one-year deal. They drafted Eli Manning number one overall. Well, he got traded there. Anyway, regardless, he was the number one pick in the draft. And it's – very deja vu where the Giants were above 500. They were playing decent football. They were in the playoff race. They were in the division race, wild card race. And then they moved to Eli Manning and, you know, Kurt Warner to quote his tweet today. He goes, I know what my man Fitzmagic is feeling in 04 with the Giants. We were a playoff team after nine games and I wasn't playing as well as Fitz was. When they moved to Eli Manning, it sucked for me. But I knew it wasn't about the season, but the future, and I'd have to say, worked out pretty well for the G-Men. And Eli Manning, being the absolute professional and stallion that he is, quote tweeted that. Don't you dare shake your head. Slandering Sir Eli the Great. He goes, thanks for being such a class act and great mentor for me. It was very telling to me, Taryn, and it told me everything I needed to know about Ryan Fitzpatrick and his relationship with Tua when Tua checked into the game against the Jets to close it out, and he's just doing this on the sideline. Mm -hmm. And he, he was just – he looked, like, genuinely happy. And I think that says a lot about Fitzpatrick. I think that says a lot about his relationship to the Dolphins and to Tua. And before we really dive into the Tua craze – how do you feel about that switch and how it seems like Fitzpatrick has handled it? Um, I mean, he's a smart guy, a veteran guy. I actually saw that when he got told that he was actually benched and no longer the starter, he said he was heartbroken like all day, um, which makes sense. But I just – it's it's not a surprise to me. I just he, – he seems like the kind of guy that would – handle that type of thing well even if it hurts and even if he wants to keep playing which I'm sure he does um and it'll be a, a good mentor for for Tua I thought about the landscape of the NFL with these rookie quarterbacks that have started this year Herbert and Burrow and then you have Tua sprinkled in between them too is there any merit to the idea that the Dolphins maybe saw how the other two guys were playing. Is, is the idea of the Dolphins having some pressure on them to put them out there to see what they got, has that crossed your mind at all? Because it, it has for me. Not really. I, I don't know what, uh, what would be causing the pressure. I, like you said, the other, the other two rookies playing well could be a factor, but I think – the fans are like, if we're playing okay, which they're playing all right, then, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. I honestly, I believe this was more of their plan in the beginning. I think after a few weeks, they're probably, you know, in meetings or whatever, already considering and like, hey, two is almost ready. We got a buy coming up. This is like, this is the time to make the switch. 
Um, and it's, who didn't really think that that was going to happen? I mean, the only way I saw him not playing this year is if his injury was bothering him. You know what I mean? But it's like, even if they're doing well and Fitz, Fitzmagic is, is doing Fitzmagic stuff, we've seen this story so many times. Like, Fitzpatrick just ain't it for as you know, great of a bridge quarterback and as cool of a dude as he is. This was going to happen at some point. Right. And also... Let's let's add some context to this. It's not like the Dolphins are beating world beaters. Right. Right. They're three and three. They're going into their bye week. And they kind of have a favorable schedule to close out the year. And look, they've lost to the good teams that they played, and they beat up on Jacksonville, uh beaten up returning Jimmy G. 49ers and they beat the Jets. Congrats if that's what you're holding your hat on. So the idea that they did fits dirty, sure. But like you said, man, I think they were this was their plan all along. And when they saw that he was cleared and he was healthy, why not? You instantly have captivated the entire Miami Dolphin fan base for the remainder of the season. You've instantly made the Miami Dolphins a national media headline. Shit, we're opening up the show with them. And you also kind of are now throwing another young buck out there to see what you got with some of the rest of these young quarterbacks in the league. Like, dude, there is a tremendous quarterback pool right now in the NFL from the guys in their mid-30s all the way down. It's it's really hard to have a bad starter in the league. Like, I don't think there's a bad starter in the league, dude. Uh, if I'm being honest with you, I think the, the, so obviously some are better than the others, but what I mean by that, I think, I think the actual quarterbacks aren't bad. Some of their situations suck. That's why Daniel Jones looks as bad as he does. That's why Sam Darnold looks rough, but you know, Gardner, Gardner Minshew as well. Like, they're not really giving him the keys to the kingdom. You're a stopgap kind of guy. So I think the quarterback play is at a really high level. And I think there is something to that, right? They they passed on Herbert and went with Tua. And Herbert has been, I mean, bro, after the before the Chiefs game, he was 40 to 1 odds to win rookie of the year. Now he's the favorite. Remember, rookie of the year isn't really a success, team success award. All right, mm-hmm. Saquon Barkley won it. Odell won it. Kyler Murray won it. And what they win at most, I think Murray won seven games last year. Yeah. So it's not – the tiebreaker is if you end up making the playoffs or whatnot, like that might skew things a little bit your way. But for the most part, it's like rookie of the year in the NBA. It's a statistical-driven award. So I like it, man. I like it. We know what Fitzpatrick is. You know, he, he beats up on the shitty teams, and he was the reason why they lost to Seattle with some of those turnovers. And th- we just we just know what he is. So I think the idea of going to Tua, I'm not going to even try to pronounce his last name, so we're just going to call him Tua. I think it's the right move. And I'm pretty sure you were, like, super high on Tua coming out, weren't you? Big Tua guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. There isn't a rookie quarterback that I was more excited to see play this year. So... I've been waiting, and it's been fun to watch Burrow and Herbert um, and those guys, but I've been waiting for, for Tua. Had it not, I said it uh, a long time ago now when I was on for the, for the draft, little draft recap, the round one recap, that he, if it wasn't for that injury, it would have been a toss-up between him and Burrow, in my mind, for QB1 in the draft. So I'm really excited. I think it's a good time to do it. The, you know, he's not playing on an all-star team, but the team, I think they've showed enough this year that it's, they're not going to ruin him. He's not starting on the Jets. So I think it's a good time, and I am hyped. Yeah, I do remember you being really outspoken about that, that uh, post-draft episode that we had you on. I- I'm – I'm fascinated by this. I like it. I think the division isn't – yo, they're a game back. 
and they still have one more game against Buffalo. They still have another game against the Jets. They always play New England tough. Mm-hmm. So they're they're in the mix, man. And that seventh wild card, you're looking at the standings in the NFL right now. And having that extra playoff team, I think it really opens up things for everyone. And yeah. right now they're three and three, along with they're a game back of the Colts, of the Browns, Buffalo, right? Just to run through the AFC, you have Steelers, Titans, five and zero. Oh. One of them is going to get a loss this week because they're playing each other. You got Kansas City and Baltimore at five and one. You got Buffalo, Cleveland, and Indianapolis at four and two. I think you could poke holes in all three of those teams. Like big holes too. Mm-hmm. You got the Raiders, Dolphins at three and three, three and two respect respectively. And then you got everyone else is below five hundred. So right now they're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're they're a game back of the last playoff. And if you're just looking at it, right, the Colts are in a tough division with Houston just playing them hard all the time, and you still have Watson, so you have a premier quarterback there. Browns are in probably the best division in football in the AFC, at least. Mm -hmm. So it's not out of the realm of possibility for them to be able to make a a playoff push. So I like it, man. I like it. I, I don't really have anything I can nitpick at that because you need to see what you got with him. Yeah, I agree. And that will not be the last time this episode I revisit that team and some of the stuff you just said about how it's not out of the question that they're a playoff team. Let's take a break real quick before we get into that little teaser that you just put out (laughs) and hear a word from our sponsor, Indeed. Indeed, baby. Even though sports had a break, your business didn't. You have to keep moving, and that makes hiring more important than ever. Indeed is here to help. Unlike other sites, Indeed gives you full control and payment flexibility over your hiring. You only pay for what you need. You can pause your account at any time, and there are no long-term contracts. Plus, Indeed provides powerful tools to make your search that much easier. With 73% of online job seekers visiting Indeed each month. Indeed is going to get you the important hire you need, just like they have for over 3 million businesses. Try Indeed out with a free $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. That is their best offer available anywhere. Go right now to Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Offer valid through December 31st. And yeah. I know, I know, Taryn. That was tremendous. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. Okay, dude. Um, nothing gets my mind going more than the idea of being in Vegas and Miami. And nothing gets my mind going more than fake trades. Mm-hmm. I am a sucker for fake trades. I get my hopes up. I... I sell myself short when nothing happens. Yep. But we've seen some notable trades the last couple of years that have had some impact. Uh, off the top of my head, I think when Sanders went to the Niners, that was really what got them to the Super Bowl, I think. Yeah. And what he meant to that team was exactly what we thought it was going to be. I want to play a little game now. We're each going to mention a player and where you would want to see him go, where you think he could go, where he's likely to go. You know, I'm already up 1-0 on the scoreboard against you because I told you Le'Veon Bell was going to Kansas City. Fair. And, you know, I just threw that wrinkle in there because, look, it's my show. So what what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Lamb Jitsu, I'm ready. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Taryn, start us off. Give us a name for a potential fake trade. Even a a rational trade, too. You know, if you want to get wild, I know you like getting wild with some uh, cap numbers as well. Start us off. So so how is this going to work? You want me to name the player first? Yeah, name the player and and try to sell me if I'm the GM. Like, Like, tell me what you would want in return. If I'm the team selling... So, like, say, for example, you have a wide receiver and you're going to sell him. You're going to be like, yo, I want a fifth-round pick. 
Okay. And I'll tell you like how likely it is where he fits into my scheme. And then you'll do the same for the teams that I, I tell you. Okay. Okay. You know, usually people have these conversations before they start recording, but you know, you shit know. is different over here. Hey, your show, like you just said. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> all right, so lead us off, man. Tell me a player. All right. First, we got to start with your boy, Julio. Oh, I'm already aroused. Probably not one of the ones that you uh, were expecting. But um, the team that I would be selling Julio to is the Miami Dolphins, who we just talked about. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Talk to me. I'm intrigued. Mm -hmm. You know you know me, man. If I'm a GM, I can get a little Julio in my life. <laughs> As if I don't have enough Julio in my life, I'm in. Yep. I mean, we're rebuilding. We got to get rid of them. You're just starting to a... Now, just how we, you know, we just talked about. And look at, like, what uh, Denver is doing with Drew Locke, giving him the best opportunity to succeed, surrounding him with as much talent as possible. What what else could a rookie quarterback ask for at this point other than Julio Jones to throw the ball to? You know what I'm saying? Um, and he's a little bit on the older side, you know, but – You watch your tone. A little bit on the older side. I said, you know, he's, he can still he can still run with the best of them. He's still the Julio that we know and love. Um, but that also means he's probably not going to be very expensive. And um, we don't need much back. Like, just a high to middle round draft pick. He can help you make extra playoff push. You know, I don't know how those teams in that division of yours are going to guard Julio Jones. And, you know, Devontae Parker, you have some studs there. So, just saying. First thinking? of all, I love the idea of what you said and the comparison to Drew Locke because that's exactly what Denver did in the offseason. And I'm for that, right? DeAndre Hopkins going to Arizona. They doubled down and said, we're going to get you some weapons. And they did that with two wide receiver picks, Hamler and Judy in the draft. They go and get Melvin Gordon. So we can't use the excuse that, oh, we didn't surround you with talent. We didn't do what the Jets have done. And I know, man, I feel bad because I got a lot of homies that are Jets fans and they've become sort of the laughing stock of the league. But it's the perfect comparison to a team that did the polar opposite of what some of these teams have done. And you do that with Tua. I've always felt like Devontae Parker would be the best number two wide receiver in football if you had an alpha across from him. I feel the same way about Juju. I think Juju would thrive on a team where he's opposite a Devontae Adams, a, a Keenan Allen, a Mike Evans kind of player. Like the way his skill set is, that's why I think he could flourish. Look, Miami has done it in the past where they they sell off players and they're not a, they have some capital too and they're not afraid to make a move to bring someone in. Julio's going to be 32 in February and I brought up this talking point one time to Allen like is it is it possible that he's washed? And he's like, "Bro, how's he washed? Week 1 he had 9 for 157." And then he was hobbled the next two games. He was hurt. He missed the game in between. And, again, I value people's opinions who cover a team and are rational with their teams like you are with the Packers as well. And he told me, he's like, bro, it is day and night the quarterback that Matt Ryan is when Julio's out there. And I think you saw that with Minnesota. I think Calvin Ridley is another guy who benefits from having Julio opposite of him. You know, you know who surprised me, bro? Will Fuller. Will Fuller is an alpha. Mm -hmm. Will Fuller showed you that he can. The only concern with him is that, you know, he's one post route away from a hamstring. But anytime he's out there, him and Watson are tremendous. So I like that idea of Julio going to Miami. I'm going to I'm going to counter that. And, you know, as you're calling Miami and you're calling. Hold on. I got his name right here. You're calling Chris Greer, the general manager of Miami. <laughs> 
I am picking up the phone and I am uh, Eric DaCosta of the Baltimore Ravens. I'm going, listen, 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 listen. I know there's some big money coming your way. Julio is due for 19 and $22 million over the next two years. Mm-hmm. You know, Lamar is, uh, he has his moments when he's throwing. I think our team is missing one thoroughbred on the outside. We love Hollywood, but let's face it, he's a, he's a five foot nine speedster, Deshaun Jackson clone. Um, no knock on his height. I'm 5'10 and proud. So hashtag under six foot gang. Uh, Taryn, how tall are you? I'm like 6'3. Six 6'3. Three. Six three. Yeah. Hmm. Let me guess. <laughs> you asked. Yeah. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get Julio. We got, we got Mark Andrews, right? Let's get Lamar, another weapon, a big time weapon, an actual alpha wide receiver. We can pay you next year. Then maybe we can restructure something because Lamar will be due up for a contract. We're not really paying anyone else outside of two DBs and a, a defensive lineman. What do you think of that, Eric DaCosta stepping in? And Julio, you know, I always talk about guys going to a new place on a contender. How, how motivated do you think he could be having Lamar Jackson having this new – energy on a team that is contending for a Super Bowl I think it would be great for Julio and would be terrifying (laughs) um for the rest of the league but I'm not sure like man the Ravens they they could use that bit you know the true number one quote-unquote wide receiver but it's like part of me just feels that I don't know how much this is going to sound a little bit wild, but for their situation specifically, I don't know how much it actually does to take that cap hit and give up picks just because it's, I don't know how they're able to take advantage of it to the level of some other teams, if that makes sense, just with, they're, I, I just don't trust their dropback pass game that much. But it's not because of the lack of weapons. They could use more, and they could use the true number one. But it's – I think it's a little bit more Lamar. That might be a hot take, but I've just never really believed in him as a passer. So it's a lot for a team that's already – you know, they're, they've already done this. Calais Campbell, Earl Thomas – it's it, get, it starts to get risky when you have one too many of those win now moves. So I'm not sure. That's it fair. doesn't make them worse. I mean, it's Julio Jones, but I like know. what you said about what it does for the landscape of the AFC as well. If you're Kansas City, you're Pittsburgh, you're Buffalo, you're the Titans. You're like, oh, fuck, man, like. <laughs> Yep. Now, if they fall behind, maybe they have the weapons to come back. So this next one I'm super excited about. I'm going to lead this one off. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to be John Lynch. Okay. I'm Joe Douglas. Pick up the phone and I go, what's up, John? How you doing? You know, I watched that Sunday night football game. You guys won. All right, I get it. I get it. You guys are sitting at three and three. You're a little hobbled. You're a little uh, banged up. But you know what stood out to me, John? What stood out to me was Jimmy G missing a wide open Kyle Juszczyk on the sideline and Sir Kyle Shanahan just being angry at that. I see Jimmy G just turning Debo Samuel into what really frustrates the lamb a bona fide end around wide receiver. I see the offense only being George Kittle or bust. What about this one? Do you know how much you're paying Jimmy G? Of course you know how much you're paying Jimmy G because you gave him that contract. Yeah. Yep. Jimmy G. Next season. 
the rest of his five-year, $137.5 million deal. Not all of it, but a good chunk. Straight up, straight up trade. Jimmy G for Sam Darnold. Wow. I know Sam is, you know, it's, you want to talk about a buy low. He's younger than Joe Burrow. When, when he's on, he elevates a shitbag roster that we have. But it's not my fault that we have a shitbag roster. It's when I inherited from McCagnin, you know, so we blame him. Hmm. What do you think about that? You have Sam Darnold for another two years. Maybe you can reload on defense and offense. And you have a quarterback that could be your guy. Look, Cali kid, right? Cali kid, SoCal baby. What do you think about that, John? Um, where do I where do I sign? Wow, yeah, you like that one? Oh yeah, I'm down with that. I mean, that's just I see no no L's in that situation for for, for me. Young QB. Get rid of Jimmy G, who through the first, like, I think two drives or something had a negative average depth of target <laughs> in that game that they still ended up winning because our coach is a super whiz genius. Potentially upgrade at the position and becoming a better football team for longer. Send him over. Put the put the kid on the plane. Just make sure he doesn't got mono. <laughs> Jimmy's going to get 24.1, 24.2 over the next two seasons while getting 23.8 right now. So you get out from that contract. You get a quarterback who is five years his youngster. I don't even know if that makes sense, but I think it does. And I think right now you could buy low on Sam Darnold. I'm not asking you to give me any draft picks, right? John, I know you're still a little soured that he overthrew Emmanuel Sanders. You guys should have a Super Bowl, right? We don't talk guys, about that. a lot of times you you know you were taking the ball out of his hands, and there are signs of elite level Jimmy G. But when it gets bad, it gets bad. So I think it's a win win for both of us. Yeah, not having to give up any draft picks and potentially a QB upgrade and more youth. I love it. That was good. I like that one. Yeah. I prepared for that one. You know, I come prepared sometimes. You know what I'm I saying? So. Uh give me another one that you got. We're gonna go we're gonna go three each, just so you guys have an idea. Mm, all right. Pressure's on. That's gonna be hard to top, man. <laughs> <laughs> so who uh who is who, who took over as, as GM for the Houston Texans? I'm blanking. So right now it's your little interim Jack Easter by Esther by Easter by interim interim. Okay. Well, that's me. Um, and I'm calling you Brian Gutekust GM of the, the green Bay Packers up there. And look, I got some rebuilding to do here. All right. But you got yourself a team. You can make a run. Um, but you need help. You need help in a couple key spots, two key spots, as a matter we of do. fact. We do. We do. Yeah, that Tampa Bay game, man, is, <laughs> is rough for the boys. And it just so happens I got two players that pretty perfectly fit those spots. What do you say for a third and a fourth round pick and we send over J.J. Watt and Will Fuller? I'll even give you a uh, second round pick. And if we make this deal this week, we don't even need to pay for transportation since we oh, play yeah, each other. Leave them there. We can just do at <laughs> halftime. You know, you know what I say? I like this trade so much. I say at halftime, you get those guys for the first half. I get them for the second half. All right. And then we don't even need to worry about commutes. We don't even need to worry about anything like that. JJ Watt comes back home, right? Wisconsin boy. Oh, yeah. You no. Know? Will Fuller playing at Notre Dame, not too far off. You know, I'm not going to say hometown, but not too far off. That is uh, 
a lot of blood will be flowing to inappropriate places for you in particular. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Which is perhaps why I, I chose it, you know, but what can you do? You give in to temptation. So dude, I, that is, that is very interesting. Um, because I'm, I'm thinking automatically I'm, I'm more excited for Wolf Fuller than I am JJ Watt. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking of that offense where Will Fuller becomes your field stretcher as opposed to Alan Lazard, who I guess it's it's not fair because he really balled out that game where he stepped up against the Saints. So tip my hat off to him. But now Devontae Adams, it, it's going to be hard to double cover Devontae. It's going to be hard to double cover Will Fuller. Can't roll safeties over the top because you got that speed threat, with Will Fuller. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, man, this adds more life to Aaron Rodgers and more, more years potentially too. Yep. It's, uh, I like that one a lot. Do you know, yeah. off the top, do you know if those guys are rumored or anything? Uh, both of them are, actually. Really? Okay. Yep. Um, I just saw a few hours ago, probably like four hours ago or so, that – the rumor for Houston's wide receivers is that all of them are on the block. Stills, Cooks, Fuller, um, and Cobb. And then I also, for the last couple weeks, I've been, maybe like a week and a half, I've been seeing rumblings about J.J. Watt. So I, like, it's my dream scenario, but I don't even think it's that crazy. I mean, they need to – they're done. Like, even with Deshaun Watson, it's just – it's a shit show. You know, they already fired their coach. Um, they need to start rebuilding here. And when you're going to get assets back, it's better sooner rather than later. Obviously, the wide receiver position for the Packers is a need, but it it's like a perfect fit. It's not just another guy. It's like you said, able to stretch the field. Good luck covering Devontae on his in-cuts and out-cuts when Will Fuller's flying past you over the top. And then on defense, we don't even need J.J. Watt to be Defensive Player of the Year, J.J. Watt, because he's never going to be again. But we get pushed around, and it's it's an upgrade. At, and what else do you need? On top of it being cool, like you said, Wisconsin boy, you know, I'd love to see it. Uh, it's... I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Do I want to get too excited about it? No, because I'm probably just going to be let down when, you know, they go elsewhere. But a guy could dream. I do want to point out that we're doing this episode about two weeks before the actual trade deadline, which is November 3rd at 4 o'clock. So just so people know, but this is where they're starting. It's November 3rd? Yeah. (laughs) What a day. Pretty sure that's also election day. That is election day, yeah. Wow. Oh, Twitter is going to be chaos. Oh, man. I don't know. I might have to stay off Twitter. <laughs> Until Schefter drops Julio to the Packers. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You're going to be all over there. I'd have to take off work. <laughs> all right. I got another one. Mm-hmm. Um, I am going to be Ryan Pace. That is the GM of the Chicago Bears. The the five and one two seed Chicago Bears. All right. Um of all the teams that are four and one or better, they have the lowest point differential at plus twelve. So sure it's nice, but your wins are over the Lions which you should have lost, the Giants, Falcons. You lost to the one good team you played in the Colts. The Bucks game was wacky. Receivers missing time. Receivers coming back. But you know what? Impressive win. And then you won at Carolina. So you haven't exactly beaten your Seattles and Kansas Cities of the world. And also, like, I still have that stink of Chicago loving the last two years. And I'm, I'm super just salty in. Trubisky when I see him on the sidelines. Plus, he wears number 10, and it's my favorite number. 
<laughs> so, okay. I'm Ryan Pace. Mm -hmm. We've had some issues with Allen Robinson, depending on what reports you like to hear. Allen Robinson, man, he's a baller. I don't know if you know that. He's, oh, I know that. He's an absolute stud. Like, this dude is one of the best wide receivers in the league that no one talks about because he's had Le Jobert's at Poor quarter. guy. Right? Blake, Blake Bortles. Bisky. You know, we like Foles, but he's also been on six teams in eight years. So take that with what you will. I don't know if we want to pay him. We don't know if he wants to stay. So as I pick up the phone and I make the call to one Howie Roseman of the Philadelphia Eagles. Mm -hmm. There's one thing with Allen Robinson. He's had one ACL tear, and then he's super-duper durable. <laughs> you guys need a lot of help at wide receiver. We like Travis <laughs> Fulgham. I know you like Travis Fulgham. Nice story. You know, drew a big P.I. against the Ravens also. He's becoming the go-to wide receiver. But, you know, he ain't no Allen Robinson. He ain't no Allen Robinson. So, how about we do this? Allen Robinson, straight up, for Zach Ertz. You're sending me lob passes. I'm, I'm hitting home runs over here. So, hell, here, hell yeah. here's, here's why, right? Zach Ertz is due for a contract. Um, I think his struggles are a little misleading because if you watch Game Pass – which now I'm breaking character. I'm going back to myself. I watched some break game pass. Dude, they double cover Zach Ertz. Yeah. And, and why wouldn't you? If you're looking at this Eagles team, you're like, well, Fulgham, okay, sure, you played three games. You are on the practice squad two, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, Sanders is out. No Alshon Jeffrey. No Deshaun Jackson. Greg Ward is a nice slot receiver. Like, he's, he's okay. Um, our Sega Whiteside. Uh, Hightower, you know, like Richard Rogers. We don't want to pay Zach Ertz. We prefer going with da Dallas Goddard because I, I think for like the last 18 games, year and a half, Dallas G has been the better tight end for the Eagles. And I think it's just time to move on. You reconnect Foles with Ertz, right? A little, a little Philly magic, Philly special loving over there. All right, you have that chemistry right off the bat. You know, we do have about 12 tight ends on the roster, but none of them are Zach Ertz for as bad as it, it's been. And, yeah, what do you what do you think about that? I mean, I, I Howie Roseman, am a huge fan of that. Uh, I'm also a breaking character. It's, it's kind of funny when you say, like, when you go back and watch that Ravens game, Marlon Humphrey – I don't know your thoughts about him. I think he's one of the best corners in football. And he was shadowing Zach Ertz for, like, a large portion of that game. Their tight end. Like, your best corner, that's how you're using him. And, like, at this point in his career, it's, it's not like he's George Kittle. So, so it wouldn't, it's not always crazy to have, you know, maybe your best guy on the tight end. But And there's just nobody else to cover on that team. Everyone else are just whatever. You can you know figure it out, um, and I also agree that I think Dallas Goddard is the better tight end right now. So I basically have still have my starting tight end and feel good about that. And I actually get a wide receiver. Time me up. And how about this little wrinkle? Mm -hmm. Gets to be closer to his lady, Julie Ertz. American soccer player plays for the Chicago Red Stars. Wow. So, and if you've watched, seriously, if you've watched their story and some of the E60s on them too, they always struggle during their seasons because one's in Philly, one's in Chicago. So now you reunite them. So, goes without saying, Julia, it's a great girl. <laughs> You're just all about the love. That's what yeah, it's man. all about. You know, it's come on. It's uh you gotta be close to your plus one. You know what I'm saying? Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Uh give me your last hypothetical trade. Okay. Um hopefully, you know, one of the, the deals we talked about didn't go through 
quite yet. Um, oh wait, so so you're Chris Ballard, okay? GM of the Colts. Mm-hmm. And do you want Philip Rivers? Just take him. <laughs> I I do not want uh, uh, Philip Rivers, but I'm Joe Douglas, and you know I've already been talking to some other teams. But you know, I figured I'd give you a call. You're kind of my guy. I don't know if to actually talk or not, but we're just having fun with it. Um, and I think it's time for me to move on from from Sammy D. He can't be worth too much anymore. I think we need a a, a stopgap. How would you? How would you like to trade me, Philip Rivers, and a second round pick? For Sam Donald, I think almost all of the the close games or the games that you've lost this year have been because of Philip Rivers. It has been. You need something for next year, and so I mean, can it's not going to be worse? Kids got potential. Give him a team. You got the team. Um, I'm interested. I, I kind of want to hold on to my second round pick, though. Hmm. This is also a a move in which you guys have. Uh, it's it's technically my second round pick, right? Because the Jets <laughs> they made the trade. Yeah, I think so. Right, so it's <laughs> like you're basically giving me back my own piece. Um. Yeah, I think I think Sam Darnold to the Colts can really light a fire under T.Y. Hilton. Uh, some of the pass catchers on that team. Um, Sam Darnold will go behind definitely a top five offensive line, right? Depending on where you want to put him. Yep. And a defense which is balling. It's a, it's a it's a it's a solid defense. It's not. You want to talk about misleading. The fact that they were like football outsiders, number one defense and PFF, like they were number three or some shit. It's like, listen, man, I get it. But like you beat the Vikings, the Jets, the, the Bears, like, yeah. you know, I don't know. The, the, the Bengals were up 21 on you and then they just fell apart. But I'm interested in that. Yeah, I think honestly, bro, I think the ideal situations for Sam Donald are San Francisco, the Colts, and fantasy booking him on Pittsburgh would be popping. Yeah. Like him being the heir apparent to Big Ben would be so dope. And I mean, even even if you'd be crazy to not like their weapons now, you know, like any wide receiver that Steelers is going to take is going to be a stud. Right, huge clay pool. He don't always have someone to throw they're the just, ball. They're just they're always gonna have a beast out there. So, mm-hmm. yeah, if if I had to say, I'd be I'd be interested. Maybe maybe we could do like a fourth round pick. Rivers in a fourth round pick. Now you're getting greedy. Look, man, you get away from that twenty five million that you're paying, paying Rivers. And what's a fourth round pick if Sam Donald's your quarterback for the next decade? It's a slap on the wrist. Yeah. Yeah. I like that one too. I like that one too. This is coming off Rivers' best game with the Colts, but it still looked gross. Like it still just looked pretty nasty. Okay. Last one for me. Me with it. I'm going to go with a guy who I've been watching for a very, very long time in the division. And I think he's a guy who. Man, if you want to talk about a dude who needs a change of scenery, I am the GM of the Washington football team. I'm Ron Rivera. And I'm going to pick up the phone, and I'm going to call Sean Payton and Mickey Loomis, and I'm going to say, yo, look, your defensive line is a little banged up. It's always good to just add more pass rushers, right? We saw San Francisco. They went to the Super Bowl because they just had six, seven deep. Remember the NASCAR package that the Giants had? 
mm-hmm. seven, eight defensive linemen out there rushing the passer. Can never have enough good pass rushers. How about we take Jameis Winston for Ryan Kerrigan? I like Jameis. I saw Jameis twice a year in division. Sure, does he throw a lot of turnovers? Yeah, he does. But you know what? I like a guy with balls. I like it dangling down to the ankle. I want a guy that's going to take risk. I'm not, I'm not trying to see check downs. I'm done with Kyle Allen. I'm done with Dwayne Haskins. I'm done with that. We got Chase Young. We got Montez Sweat. So he's, he's expendable. His contract expires after this year. We don't want to re-sign him. And let me take Winston. Why not? Why not? At least, at least we'll become must-see TV because Terry McLaurin's going to all of a sudden become Chris Godwin 2.0. Uh, Winston is going to probably shatter another record, maybe go 20-20, right? 20 picks, 20 touchdowns because he can't get the 30-30 again. And you guys need some defensive line help. Your defense has not been as good as we thought it would be. So, Mickey, how do you feel about this one? You would you would like this one, wouldn't you? I would, yeah. I don't think I'm feeling it. Hmm. Is it is is one thing that's crossing your mind the idea of Drew Brees maybe being washed? Being washed. It is. It is. Yeah. Um you know, if all of a sudden we're in week fourteen and old old Drew can't throw the ball more than 30 yards down the field. <laughs> we might need famous Jameis to come in here and, and start slinging that thing. Not like, you know, how he did, you know, off the field, not sling like we can, you know, just ignore that for now. But also Ryan Kerrigan, like, what, that's just, you're, you're trying to sell me a name, I think. Yeah, well, I think that's fair. That's a fair up there performance. He's not the same Ryan Kerrigan, you know. He's been at the top of his game, PFF grade in the tank, um, and being on a line that is a, fr- a front, a whole defensive front that's that strong, even makes him look better. I think than he already is. So oh, I don't know. I want to um, end the show on this one. Kind of just uh, reminding me of it. Um, I enjoyed this. We could have we could have went on for like another two hours, but oh, yeah. Antonio Brown his suspension is up after week eight, and there are some teams that are interested in him. Without spending too much time on this, give me a team that you think he should maybe go to. Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Why? Uh, because as like it's hard to know these guys, but I think with him specifically, you have to. The fit is more about is more than just football, like as we know with Antonio Brown, and I think if there's a place where he can relax, and maybe just get back to playing football, hopefully. I think it's Seattle. As far as I'm aware, he's pretty good friends with Russell Wilson, and Russell Wilson's a hell of a leader, not a drama guy. Um, he's, like, really nice and just a good dude. It's one of the reasons I don't really like him that much. I just, I like, just, you know, it's like when UFC fighters are too nice. Do you like that? I don't like that. Like, I want you to be a dog a little bit. In but regards anyway, to what? You know, like – like a, a, like anytime I would see a a UFC fighter, oh I forgot his name, dude. Like when they're for all the pre-fight press conferences, I like the I like the shit talking. I like the you know I'm gonna not just I'm gonna give my best effort and just complimenting you know the opponent up and down. It's being respectful is fine, but just like I don't know, I just feel like in some sports you have to have a little bit of dog in you. What is the guy? He was Sage Northcutt? Northcutt, yeah, Sage Northcutt. Like, that is the type of guy I'm talking about. I never liked him when I was really big into the UFC. And that's kind of who Russell Wilson reminds me of. 
but he's great. I mean, we're off on a tangent. So I think Antonio Brown could actually stay there and play football. And he can't be worth much. So I know they already have like two great wide receivers, but there's three on the field a lot of the time. And if he's anywhere close to the Antonio Brown that we have seen in the past, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, and Antonio Brown from Russell Wilson, like good night. Yeah. Well, in regards to the UFC thing, I, I do think a level of respect comes out of you after you went to battle with someone that maybe they surpass your expectations or they're tougher than they, you expected and they earn your respect. I think after the fight is completely different. Okay. So you're talking about prior. Like, I mean, yeah, exactly. Like it's a perfect example would be like Connor and, uh, and Nate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you obviously before everyone knows how, how that was just, it's nothing, but they're just at each other. And it was, it's all respect afterward. That, that is how, like, I think it should be. I don't like it beforehand when it's just, it's like too nice for, for no reason. Yeah, people have always said that Donald Cerrone, Cowboy, is is a guy who like sort of makes you like break, put down your guard, and then that's when he's like the most vicious. But I hear what you're saying. Well, I wouldn't do it if I was Seattle. Why ruin a good thing? I get the talent, but everything that we've seen from this guy, the last three teams he's been on, he's one Instagram model away from her unfollowing him to to him snapping and being like yo fuck this girl like just start doing wild shit which is you know ultimately what got him kicked out of new england was he had that those allegations against him yep. and he like dm the girl and new england is very clean cut and they're like listen any shit that happened prior to us like we'll deal with it we'll deal with it but none of that here now and, like, bro, I remember he played the Dolphins. He had, like, nine targets. Like, right off the bat, first game, just nine targets. Tom Brady was like, oh, my God, I'm fucking 30 again. <laughs> I have a weapon. Right. And then he he went out and he just was, like, screenshotting DMs and posting shit. And then before you know it, they, they cut him. So, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go there if I was Seattle. I, th- I think a team that could be interesting for him to go to and if you're a contender and you want to take the chance, but you need to have some stability in your organization, I think Baltimore. He's cousins mm-hmm. with, with Hollywood Brown. You have Harbaugh there. You have Newsom there. Um, I, I don't know, but I, I think he has a good relationship with Lamar Jackson. And you got, like, you got some vets over there. You got, you got Humphreys. You have Marcus Peters, who's oh, – kind of a head case too but you got Calais Campbell and you brought him in there for that veteran presence too so I would I would more likely go there where I this I think he helps Baltimore more and he hurts Seattle more if he was to go there so why why do you think that he hurts Seattle and not Baltimore? Like, do you just think that the organization is that much more stable or the closeness of him to the players on the team? Because those those both seem pretty similar to me. And I will say Baltimore was my second option, probably. Well, I think that Lockett and Metcalf are playing at such a high level. Why would you throw a wrinkle in that? Whereas Baltimore... Even Hollywood Brown, he's the kind of receiver that I don't like. I don't like wide receivers that are either drag routes or deep routes. And that's what I feel Hollywood is. Like, he's one of the fastest receivers in the league. But those guys are very volatile. They'll have eight for 171 and one. But he's he's Brandon. When I see him, he's Brandon Cooks. Mm-hmm. Where he's basically going to have those spike weeks eight for 133 and two touchdowns and then he'll have two for 20 or or one for for 19 and with seattle they're a pass funnel so you know that the targets are going to go to them too the majority of them they're they probably account for like 60 percent of the targets that 
Russell Wilson has combined. Mm-hmm. So why throw a wrinkle in there and throw that off? Where I think he he would be more important to Baltimore's success offensively because I don't think they have that kind of depth at the position. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. This is the problem with Antonio Brown. Because um, it's like, I, when I look at it that way, like why mess up what you have with the receiving core, that's valid. I guess I just think that, you know, if they would sign him, it'd be for chips. Like, it's not going to be – there's no way he can be worth any sort of money. So, if he decided to play, it would be for cheap. And that, like, core is strong enough where if they're like, all right, either this works and it makes us better or it doesn't and we just go back to what we were already doing. But, like, the problem with him is – it's just like you said, it could ruin it, but I see the same sort of thing as a possibility in Baltimore. So, maybe contenders should just stay away from him. Like, do you, could you not see a world where all of a sudden he needs more, he, he starts to feel like he's not getting any attention because they don't throw the ball that much? Or, and when he, when Lamar does throw the ball, it's just to his tight ends over and over or something like that. And he starts to get animated because he's, you know, not a focal point. It's a tough thing with him, man. It's, he's, he's a wild card. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. He is. And it's a shame because if he was still playing, he'd still be in that discussion for best wide receiver in the game. No question. So, all right, man. This was fun. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on again. Uh, where can they find you if they want to contact you? Yeah, no problem, man. It was a great time. Um, hopefully, you know, some of these can come to fruition for the trade deadline, and, and we can talk about that then. But... Uh, you can find me on Twitter. It's uh, at Taryn Caravella, T-A-R-E-N-C-A-R-A-V-E-L-L-A. Shouts to the members of the Patreon. We have Christopher Velasquez, Derek Pleates, Orvica, Corey Johnson Hoops, Nick Chavez, and Ryan Pisner. Guys, go check out the Patreon. Some extra content on there. I'm going to be cranking it up the moment we get into the new studio. Um, we are doing a giveaway. Everyone in the $10 tier on Patreon for the month of October. It's a crew neck. It's a hat. It's a shirt. Just go to either Twitter or to Instagram at Veterans Minimum and you can see what it's going to look like for you to be eligible. You just need to sign up for the month of October. And that's that, man. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the games. And most importantly, congrats.